sir. All right. Thank you. I think we're going to sit back here on the back row somewhere. Back over here. Take your baby close to me. I was going to bring you a frost to the weather got against me. The weather turned away one frost to weather. Well, uh, one day next week. I got a lot of things blooming in my yard, and I wish I knew what they were. Uh, come on over and tell me. We'll have a visit. Back here on the back road. Yeah, it's easier to get out with these, uh, these things we got instead of trying to get down there and get behind everybody. I'm trying to figure out do, do I want to get a broom or something and sweep that No, I thought they is. Oh, did you? And I went and opened the gun. The gun took room for me before he even got the dust off. Okay. And he said he would take care of it after church. Oh, oh great. I don't have to worry about it. He can maneuver a lot better than we can. Oh, and absolutely. I told him that you would put two chairs out there. You don't want nobody to gash up the tires. And uh, I told him if, we'd, uh, if I'd have some cones, I said I looked in the furniture room back then and I didn't see any cones, but he would have tried to get some out there. And he said he didn't have a key to, to the room. I said, well, I'll go get the room next place. Hmm. Got my key. Still, the key still works. <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the key works to the room. The same one that you to the church. Yeah. Um, I say they rather swim. Good morning, and welcome to Trinity United Methodist Church. So glad you decided to come and worship God this morning here in this place with these people. Um, a few announcements for you. One, you should have a handout in your bulletin, or maybe it went out last week. Um, but the Good News class is inviting widows and widowers to a luncheon next Saturday. So if you are one of those things, um, make sure you get information and talk to Janet. Where'd Janet go? Oh, Janet's not here. Talk to Dave. You know, find somebody. Kathy, anybody. Um, they'll answer your questions. Um, next is, as part of our journey through Lent, uh, many of the connection groups are reading a book called Reckless Love by the new bishop in Florida, Tom Berlin, though he wrote it before he was um, sent to Florida. He's from the Virginia Conference. Um, it's all about how to be love. Um, so that'll be our kind of theme as we're going through Lent. Um, we will, so if you would like to read the book, or find a group to discuss it with, make sure you talk to me. Um, the books are about 15 bucks each, so if you can reimburse the church for your copy, those can be found down the hall in the Welcome Center. If you would like to pick one up, if you would like to find a group, 
If you are not in a group or not in a group that's doing the book, make sure you talk to me. Um, we also have a quilt this morning, thanks to our quilt ministry. It's, well, there goes the flyer. It's a beautiful quilt of blues and yellows, and it's for Leland Ferguson, whom I do not see this morning. Um, and it says, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. For you are my praise, Jeremiah 17, 4. Let's pray over this quilt. Almighty God, we give you thanks um, for the, the um, cotton plants as they grew the fibers. We give you thanks for all of the hands that turned those fibers of cotton into cloth. And we give you thanks for the hands which lovingly sewed together this quilt that it might be an article of love to remind your servant Leland of your love for him. Lord, we pray that it will be a way for him to feel your love. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We would like to welcome all worshipers through the media which they're joining us with. Our greeting is going to be read responsively, and so your part as a congregation is in bold print. So if you would please rise for the our greeting. People of God, on this wilderness journey, what will you eat? The word, the word of the Lord is our daily bread. People of God, in this time of temptation, how will you live? Our faith is in the faithfulness of God. People of God, at this kingdom crossroad, whom will you serve? We worship the Lord our God alone. And join us in our first hymn, Depth of Mercy found on page 355.
be seated and find your prayer for illumination. May we pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, may we hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson is Psalm 32, and we are going to read that responsively, so if you will follow along with us. Blessed are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed are those whom the Lord does not hold guilty, and in whose spirit there is no sin. When I do not declare my sin, my body wasted away, throw my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Therefore, let those who are godly offer prayer to you. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You encompass me with deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. Do not be like an unruly horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle. Many are the pains of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous. Shout for joy. Our New Testament lesson is Romans 5, 12 through 19, and you may follow along as it is being read. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, and so death spread to all because all have sinned, sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned when there is no law. Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died, through the one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. And the free gift is not like the effect of the one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If, because of the one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. May we be blessed through the reading, listening, and believing of his word. Amen. Thank you. 
We have our youngest disciples come up this morning. Come, Dan Daniela. Come on, boys. Okay, we got one here. Oh, good. Oh, you brought someone with you. How? Oh. Yeah, oh, it's your baby. Hi, guys. Okay. Okay, boys and girls. We're going to talk about a word today that you may have heard, but you may not know the meaning of it. Have you ever heard the word to be tempted? It's nothing to do with your temperature. Do you know what tempted means? Well, it's a big churchy word, but it's a word we need to know. If we're tempted to do something, it means like we're thinking, oh, I'd like to have that candy bar, but mom told me not to eat something before dinner, but wow, it looks so good. You're tempted to eat that candy bar, right? Yeah, well, this morning, I want to talk about something else you might be tempted. Do you have crayons at home? Who has crayons? Who has crayons at home? We've got to have some adult colorers here, too. Crayons at home, right? Okay. All right. What do you do with crayons? Draw. You draw. You color. You color on paper. You color in a coloring book. Well, have you ever looked at your crayons and you've been tempted, like, you have no crayons? Well, you will in a few minutes. Oh, well, we will. We will. And you look at it and think, oh, maybe I could color with my crayons on that table. Hmm. <gasps> look at the wall in my bedroom. It looks kind of plain where Mom just painted it. Maybe I could use my crayons on the wall. <gasps> that would be tempting, wouldn't it? What? You would not do that. Good for you. Well, that's what we're going to learn about today. I know you're, yeah. So anyway, if you're tempted, it means there's this little voice in your head that says, oh, go ahead and do it. Nobody will notice. They won't know that you colored there. And then there's another little voice in your head that says, mm-mm, not such a good idea. And like you said, I won't do that. You cannot erase it. That's right. Did you know that Jesus was tempted? He was tempted by the devil. He was tempted to do something against God. And just like you said, I wouldn't do that. Jesus said, no, devil, go away, because I am not going to sin against my father God. I won't. Pastor Karsten's going to be p talking to the adults about how Jesus was tempted. And when we go to children's church, we're going to talk about being tempted, too. And guess what? You're going to have crayons to use, too. How about that? You think that's a good idea? There's crayons for you. Okay. And crayons for Daniela. And crayons for you boys. And let's go see how we're going to do this lesson and learn about how Jesus was tempted. All right, are we ready? Hmm? All right, shall we pray together? Let's, let's say a prayer. 
Let's bow our heads, and you can repeat, okay? And all of God's children are going to be part of this prayer. Thank you for sending Jesus to live a perfect life. Thank you, God, that Jesus can help us when we are tempted. Help us to do the right thing. To love, serve, and obey you. Thank you for the love of Jesus. Amen. Okay, let's go see what we're going to do with these crayons and the story we're going to hear, okay? of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And let the people say, Amen. Amen. Good morning. morning. As I said, welcome to Reckless Love, our worship series at Trinity for Lent. We take 40 days to prepare for Easter, plus those six Sundays, to prepare to tell once more the story of the Passion, the story of Holy Week, the story of Jesus' final days, his Last Supper, his betrayal. His trial, torture, and execution, how he lay in the grave on Saturday, and how he rose again on Sunday. It takes us some time to get ready to get there. And the English poet priest Malcolm Geit prescribes Lent is a time to set aside and reorient ourselves, to clarify our minds, to slow down, recover from distraction, to focus on the values of God's kingdom and on the value he has set on us and on our neighbors. For this first Sunday of Lent, we journey out into the wilderness with Jesus to watch as he is tempted by the devil. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. This is Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, And afterwards, he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and all their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give to you, if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So as the Spirit leads us into the wilderness of Lent, we venture out because Jesus has gone into the wilderness before us. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings Jesus into the wilderness, leading Jesus into the wilderness just as the Spirit had led the Israelites before him into the wilderness by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire after the grand exodus from Egypt. Right before this passage in Matthew, Jesus has been baptized by John in the Jordan, has had the Spirit descend upon him like a dove, and heard a voice from heaven announce that Jesus is God's beloved Son. So like Israel, after the exodus from the waters, The Spirit leads him into the wilderness. Matthew says that Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, echoing the 40 days and nights that Moses fasted while he was on top of the mountain with God as he received God's law with which to instruct God's people. In the wilderness, without food or drink, what sustains Jesus is God alone. 
When God led the Israelites out into the wilderness, they didn't bring much food with them. And it didn't take very long before God's people started complaining. God, why didn't you just leave us to die in Egypt? At least we had food back there. Why did you want us to die out here instead? Imagine, for a minute, that a friend invites you to go backpacking. So you all have somebody drop you off at the trailhead all the way out in the wilderness, and then you're going to head out and go experience God's good creation. Soak in all the nature, get away from it all, have a nice spiritual retreat. So you all hike all morning, you throw down a quick protein bar out of your pocket for lunch, and then you get back on the trail and you are going, you're making progress, you are young and you're fit, and you're 25 miles from that trailhead. You don't see any other hikers all day, you're way out in the boonies. But now it's getting dark. So you find a nice little spot to camp down, you go gather some firewood and your friend kind of gets camp ready. You get that fire going, you start to hear the coyotes howling, and you look across at your friend and you say, so, what's for dinner? And your friend looks at you and says, dinner? Oh, we didn't bring food. Wouldn't you start to ask some of those same questions the Israelites were asking Moses? Wouldn't you wonder why you had been brought out into the wilderness? Had you just been let out here to die? Would you still trust your friend? Those are the kinds of questions the Israelites ask, the kinds of questions we would ask. But unlike us and unlike the Israelites, Jesus doesn't do any of that. Matthew doesn't record any, why, God, why, from Jesus. He's just hungry. That is noted. He is famished. In this wilderness time and place, when he's out of his element, when he's been weakened by going without food and water, where he's alone, Jesus is famished. Thirsty, tired. And that's when the devil comes. That's when he's tempted. Which is exactly how temptation works, doesn't it? Temptation is weak when you're feeling good, when you had a good meal, when you're at church, when you're surrounded by your people, when you're staying rooted in God's holy word. But when you're alone, when you're weak, when you're in an unfamiliar or threatening environment, when God feels far away, when everything's falling apart in your life, and it's three o'clock in the morning, and you're awake, and you can't sleep, that's when those lying voices in your head get loud. That's when the lies are at their most persuasive. It's out in the wilderness that our metal is tested, and the nature of our character revealed. It's after Job has lost everything that he's invited to curse God and die. He's not tempted to do that when he's got his life together. So when Jesus is at his weakest, when he's got nothing to rely on except for God, that's when Satan strikes. The devil suggests that Jesus could solve his little problem, that he could just command the stones to become loaves of bread if he really is the Son of God. The devil starts putting some seeds of doubt about that identity spoken over Jesus at his baptism. After all, when God told Moses to command the stones in the wilderness to pour forth water at Meribah, Moses lost faith and he just struck the stones instead with his staff. Can't Jesus, the new Moses, do one better, and just command them to become bread for him to eat. Yet Jesus stays true, and he quotes Moses against the devil. For Jesus, his status as God's son indicates his utter dependence on God, his steadfast obedience to God, not his ability to work party tricks. If he's out there to fast, he's going to fast. And famished as he is, those stones still do not yet look good enough to eat. So next, the devil tries a different tactic, protection. If Jesus is really God's son, won't God keep him from harm? How could God permit God's anointed to suffer? Why would God let bad things happen to good people? So the devil takes Jesus to the holy city, and in this context, that means Jerusalem, not Charleston. Just wanted to clear that up. And it's there in the holy city, on the high place of the temple, 
at the focal point of Jewish religious, political, economic life. Jesus can make a statement. He can announce his campaign. He's running for Messiah in the most dramatic fashion possible. Instead of just riding down an escalator, he's going to leap from the temple's heights, the devil suggests. And God's angels will catch him and set him gently down, and everybody will know that Jesus is the Lord's anointed, that he is blessed and highly favored, that Jesus is the one that God has sent to redeem Israel and all the world. But Jesus replies simply, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. To demand that God act in big, showy ways would go against the M.O. of the kingdom. God's kingdom is coming everywhere all at once, but in darkness and weakness, not in spectacular entrances. Even when Jesus rises from the dead, when he's all set for his ultimate, I told you so, he doesn't though go over to Pilate and the high priest and say, see, I'm alive again. It didn't work. I'm here. I told you. Jesus just you know, kind of goes off to Galilee and gets back together with that same bunch of misfits and sinners, his so-called friends who abandoned him as soon as the soldiers came to arrest him. That's how Jesus likes to work. But the devil has one more ploy, and it's dramatic. You can almost hear the John Williams score crescendo as Jesus goes on top of that mountain, the swelling, shimmering strings behind him. And so from this top of the mountain, the devil lays all the kingdoms of the world in front of him. All their glory. It's the opposite of the transfiguration story we heard last week. Last week, the disciples look up the mountain and there see the humble rabbi, their friend Jesus, shimmering white, revealed in all his glory. At the temptation, Jesus looks down out, away, and beholds everything else. Instead of up to God, he looks out over the world. And the devil puts before him everything he has to offer. It's interesting, isn't it? That the story doesn't seem to question the devil's claim to the kingdoms of the world. The devil's claim that they're under satanic sway, that they're his to give away to whomever he chooses. The story assumes that all the glitz and glamour of wealth All the might of the world's armies answer not to God, but to fallen angels. It seems in the temptation of Jesus that there's not one nation under God, but every nation under Satan. And all of it the devil lays before Jesus. It requires only that Jesus bow down before the devil and worship the devil alone. Now when we hear worship, it tends to bring to mind religious expressions of attachment. When we think about worship, we think about singing hymns or saying prayers or offering praises, talking to God. But the Greek word had a little bit wider meaning, a wider meaning we should probably hear in our English word worship as well. The devil's offer probably means something broader, something closer to, I'll give all of this to you if you will pledge allegiance to me. Will Jesus turn his back on God and serve the devil instead? Instead of bringing his kingdom quietly with a small band of disciples with mysterious, confusing parables hung on a cross, Jesus can bring his kingdom as the crucifier instead. Can see if he can bring God's ends by the devil's means. Jesus can do things the world's way with might and power and wealth can bring the kingdom that way instead of the way the kingdom is coming through humility and service. It might work this time, but that's not the road Jesus takes. He sends Satan away and he vows he will worship the Lord alone. He will serve only God. The temptation story ends decisively. Jesus remains faithful, the devil goes away, and God's angels come and attend to Jesus. I wonder if they perhaps served up the same meal which Abraham ate at the Oaks of Mamre. The meal that the Israelites feasted upon in the wilderness. 
the meal which was brought to Elijah by crows. Jesus' wilderness time of fasting, tempting, testing is over. And Jesus has won the day. But our Lenten sojourn in the wilderness has barely begun. We're following the Holy Spirit's lead into this Lenten wilderness time of preparation. Jesus was led into the wilderness before his public ministry could begin to ensure that he is ready to bring the kingdom of God, a ministry which will pose such a threat to the way that things have always been that Jesus will be hung to die. To go into the wilderness is a daring, even a reckless thing to do, to leave behind the safety and the comfort of normalcy and venture instead into the liminality and danger of wilderness. We're led into the wilderness and Lent to deepen in our bones the truth of the sort of kingdom which Jesus brings. It's hinting at this wilderness nature of Lent that we've replaced the brass on the altar with wood, with burlap, a way of taking away some of the pretty stuff so that we can focus only on God. Because the kingdom that Jesus brings is not what we would expect. Jesus doesn't come bringing magic bullets, solving all our problems. He doesn't come with flashy demonstrations or incontrovertible spectacle, and he certainly doesn't play by the world's rules. We need some time in the wilderness, some time to clarify our minds, as Geit put it. If we are to be ready to watch as all of this comes together in the story of Jesus' passion, where instead of becoming the head of government, Jesus is crushed under its heel. Instead of being whisked out of danger, he is tortured and nailed to the cross. Instead of commanding stones to turn into bread, he is hung atop the stone of Gethsemane, dying under the weight of our sin. It takes something out of the ordinary to help us be ready to behold such a Savior. For many, abstaining from something like meat or alcohol or chocolate or social media, that can help. Not because any of those things are inherently bad. Well, maybe social media. Um, but so that in giving up these things, we might be guided in those times when we might have otherwise relied on these material things to turn instead to the God who is spiritual. For many, adding during Lent some more dedicated time for prayer, for studying the scriptures, for serving others can have that same purpose. We give up and we take up to focus our minds on Christ. It's because Jesus knew God's scriptures inside and out that he was able to resist the devil's temptation. He didn't have to come up with a good reason to rebuke the devil. He just knew the word of the Lord. And since we need to be led ever deeper into this mystery of the kingdom, the surprising ways that God chooses to work among us, we go back around Lent every year as the Holy Spirit keeps working on us, leading us deeper into the wilderness, leading us where God wants us to be. The good news this morning is that Jesus' time in the wilderness isn't just an example that we're expected to follow. Because Lord knows we don't do that. It doesn't take 40 days of fasting to get me to succumb to temptation. I can do it much quicker than that. We'll, and we'll all fall for far less than the offer of all the kingdoms in the world. It doesn't take that kind of a bait for us to miss the mark daily in countless little ways, individually and collectively. If this was just a parable to encourage us to resist temptation in our own lives, we would not be any closer to actually resisting to temptation, to actually having the power to succeed in that battle. We would just be more acutely aware of all of the ways that we fail when Jesus succeeded. But the good news for us today is that the story of the temptation is not just a good example, but it's a deep and powerful truth. It's good news that where we had been telling a story in our lives of failing to live up to God's standards, 
of missing the mark, of succumbing to temptation, when the story of the church, quite frankly, shows us falling for the same temptations which Jesus was able to resist, the church continues to play by the world's playbook. But Jesus did it differently. And in hearing the story of Jesus living differently and Jesus re-narrating the story of humanity, we find that God has done for us what we could not do for ourselves. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Oh God, all too often we cannot live up to your standard. All too often when temptation comes knocking, we let it right in and do whatever it would have us to do and yet we rejoice this morning that your son our savior Jesus Christ was able to succeed where we fail Lord that in his dependence upon you he tells a different story for humanity a story where sin and death do not win the day Because, Lord, when we in all of our sin could not handle having him around anymore and we hung him up to die on a cross and we tried to put him away in a tomb, Lord, in your grace, you did not let sin and death have the last word on him. The stone was rolled away. And on Easter Sunday morning, Jesus Christ rose from the dead as a promise that the power of sin and death had been broken. And that though sin and death would win victories in the meantime, someday they would be abolished forever. So Lord, as we live in this time between the times, in this time where we still feel the power of sin and death, grieving particularly this morning, your beloved servant, Linda Johnson. Lord, we pray that you will give us the hope to endure. Give us the patience to suffer without losing heart. Give us your Holy Spirit that by your grace we would have what we need to resist temptation. Lord, as we journey in this wilderness time of Lent, let it be a time of purification, a time of sanctification a time to repent of our sins and get right, to get right with you, with our neighbors, that we might carry your love out of this wilderness place and into the world. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ was faithful where we were faithless, but by his faithfulness we are given the faith we need to worship him. Let us stand and affirm our faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In the story of the temptation of Jesus, it seems that all the money and power in the world belongs to the devil. And so I would encourage you to get all that devil money off your hands and put it in these plates as our ushers come forward. Where are you? Don't worry about that.
pray that you work a miracle this morning, that you would take this money and use it for the purposes of your kingdom. We give thanks to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. After a time of fasting, Jesus received in the wilderness everything which he needed to go forth into his ministry. A miracle. Angels came and waited upon him. See if angels don't serve you what you need this morning. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with God and one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful Merciful God. God. We confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give our thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth you formed us into your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights, you bore up the ark on the waters Save Noah and his family and establish an everlasting covenant with every living creature upon the earth. When you delivered us from slavery and made us your covenant people, you led Moses to your mountain for 40 days and 40 nights and gave us your teachings. You led us through the wilderness and fed us manna for 40 years and brought to us the promised land. When we forsook your covenant, you led your prophet Elijah to the mountain, where as he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, He heard your still, small voice. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. When you gave him to save us from our sin, your Spirit led him into the wilderness where he fasted 40 days and 40 nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died on a cross for our sin, you raised him to life, presented him alive to the apostles during 40 days, and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Now, when we, your people, prepare for the yearly Paschal Feast for your Son's death and resurrection, you lead us to repentance for our sin and the cleansing of our hearts, that during these 40 days of Lent we may be gifted and graced to renew the covenant you made with us through Christ. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take Eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now with the confidence of children, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As this is one loaf and we are one body, we share in the body of Christ. And this is one cup. And we are one body, and we drink the blood of Christ. This table is open. All are welcome to come to receive. You'll be receiving by intention, so you'll receive the, the bread, and then you can dip that into the chalice. We also have prepackaged elements, both regular and gluten-free, and we also have gluten-free bread. That station will be in the center. Pastor Carson and myself will be to either side to uh, You'll be directed by the ushers as to which section, according to your, where you were seated, to the station that is right in front of you. We pray that you will open your minds and hearts, leave everything you got in the, in the pews, come forward to receive this gift of grace. We'll go ahead and have our servers come forward as well. Go ahead and have the choir come forward.
Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you as we are on this journey through the wilderness that you have nourished us with your body, with your blood, with your life breath. May this nourish us through this day and through the days ahead. For whatever might come our way, temptations, they will come. Knowing though that through Lent, And through the wilderness, there is an Easter. Walk with us, journey with us. Show us and give us your reckless love. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand and sing our closing hymn, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, hymn 359.
So go out from this place for a happy Lent. Happy because God has done for us what we could not do for ourselves. Go in peace. Amen.